Hello, I'm uh, Paul Beckwith. In this video, I want to revisit a couple um, articles, excellent articles that were written a few years ago. And um, they're asking basically existential questions about uh, climate change. Can climate change actually wipe humanity from the face of the earth? And if so, by when? And if not, um, you know, how many survivors or how many people will exist on this planet, say by 2100? So there's a couple really good articles, like I said, from a few years ago that address this very question. You know, you probably and myself and many other people have looked with utter amazement at COP28 at what's been going on with the oil companies in the background and, uh, you know, have they hijacked the climate talks? You know, will anything come out of the talks? Uh, you know, and the numbers are actually close to 100,000 people. You know, they were expecting 7,000 there, and then it was 83,000. You might have seen some reports. But the numbers, I'll look at the the numbers in detail in, in another video, but the numbers are close to 100,000. And, you know, it's just so unwieldy at this stage. Um, and uh, a paper came out recently that looked at how people get to the cops and the number of private jets and the carbon burn per kilometer of flight of private jets carrying only a few people. And, uh, yeah, I mean, they're not, it's just it's just all a big gong show, or maybe we should call it, uh, you know, COP28, uh, Burning Man in Dubai, you know, the Burning Man Festival. I mean, that would be a better um, name, perhaps, for it. But anyway, let's look at what these articles uh, said in the past, and uh, if anything, you know, climate has accelerated greatly since they were both written. So this is one of them. There's a cultural comment to the New Yorker by Jonathan Franzen um, from over just over four years ago. What if we stop pretending the climate apocalypse is coming? To prepare for it, we need to admit that we can't prevent it. Okay, so that's one of the articles. But the first article um, I'm going to talk about is one um, that was, uh, you know, is basically, you know, asking, can the climate crisis wipe out six billion people? And uh, I, it, it came across my Twitter feed, and I thought, yeah, this is a good topic. So this is the article. It was written um, just after the previous article I showed you. Again, you know, over just over four years ago. So the answer is yes. The climate crisis may wipe out six billion people. If you look at what's happened since, um, you know, over the intervening years since this article and the other one were written, things have greatly accelerated and gotten a lot, a lot worse. So this article is by William Rees, who's a emeritus professor of human ecology and ecological economics at the University of British Columbia. Okay, so he basically addresses, has a lot of points and calculations and says that, you know, he provides some grim calculations for humanity of climate change and growth in population and consumption fueled by cheap energy goes unchecked. And we know it's actually, not only is it going unchecked, but it's a lot worse. You know, the world right now collectively is burning over a hundred million barrels of oil per day to fuel our economy and everything else that we do and have done in the last uh, few centuries. And uh, we're clearly not able to get out, get, reduce it. You know, the idea, you know, there's going to be a huge argument over the next week or so to be phase it. Can we say phase it out? You know, a few countries are going to vote and say, no, we have to phase it down, you know, not out. And like they're arguing over semantics and meanwhile the planet continues to get boiled. So 
Here's a quote by Chris Hedges. I always like Chris Hedges' work. Carbon emissions may continue to rise. The polar ice caps may continue to melt. Crop yields may continue to decline. The world's forests may continue to burn. Coastal cities may continue to sink under rising seas and droughts may wipe out fertile, fertile fam, farmlands. But the messiahs of hope assure us that all will be right in the end, only it, it won't. Okay, so, and I really like this, uh, the way it starts off this article, right? The climate crisis really underscores the fact that homo sapiens are not primarily a rational species, right? When humans are forced to make important decisions, particularly decisions affecting our economic security or socio-political status, primitive instinct and raw emotion tend to take the upper hand. You now the caveman brain, if you like, comes into play, the amygdala, neurons fire up, and emotions, uh, you know, uh, suppress the ability of our rational, you know, uh, more, more evolved parts of the brain. It needs to get hijacked by these the emotions and good state. This is not a good thing, but the fate of society is at stake. Take hope, for example. For good evolutionary reasons, we, we naturally tend to be hopeful. Humans tend to be hopeful in times of stress. So gently comforting is this word, even the word hope gives you these warm, fuzzy feelings. Um, some people even call their daughters the name Hope. But Hope can be enervating. It can take away energy. It can be flat out debilitating when it merges with mere wishful thinking. Rainbows and unicorns. When we hope, for example, that some technology alone can save us from climate change. Okay, so the novelist, and this is the other article, he asks, if your hope for the future depends on a wildly optimistic scenario, what will you do 10 years from now when the scenario becomes unworkable even in theory? And of course, uh, you know, they bring in Roger Hallam, right, the Extinction Rebellion guy in the UK. He can scarcely be held up as a messiah of hope. He's a co-founder of Extinction Rebellion, and that's, they've been warning of societal collapse for years. Um, he had a session with BBC's Hard Talk, and again, this article is four years ago. This stuff was from four years ago. He irritated multiple cultural nerves. He claimed on the basis of hard science that six billion people will die as a result of climate change in the coming decades. Okay? Um, more specifically, our ruling elites. And they are ruling elites. I mean, people at the COP that are, the COP is always two conferences. It's the NGOs, it's the, it's the, the people basically. And then that's one conference. And the other one totally separate is the policy makers, government people, you know, and they're all in the 1% category or 0.1%. They're the people flying in in private jets, etc. And it's totally separate conference. And the scientists are all in the, um, in, in the uh, cheap seats, if you like. They don't get the seat at the table of the negotiations. So the negotiations never lead to anything scientifically valid, really. Okay, so are ruling elites in action and lies on climate change, and they control the media, of course, will lead to climate turmoil, mass starvation, and general societal collapse in this century? And the, the, the talk show host interviewing Hallam, he couldn't wrap his mind around Hallam's unyielding assertions. So he's not, he's not the only skeptic, okay? So you see many scientists say, you know, including the man himself, say there's still time. There's still time to turn around and do stuff. Um, you know, they dismiss Hallam 
and his assertions outright. The idea that 6 billion people are doomed to die by 2100 is simply not correct, this guy says. No mainstream prediction indicates anywhere near this level of climate change induced human mortality for any reason. Another senior scientist, Ken Caldera at Carnegie, he points out there's no analysis of likely climate damage that has been published in the quality peer-reviewed literature that would indicate that there is any substantial likelihood that climate change could cause the starvation of 6 billion people by the end of this century. So the key to understanding these rejections is the language, right? No mainstream prediction, no, nor analysis in the peer-reviewed literature. Keep in mind that scientists are reluctant, they're reticent for professional reasons to go far beyond the immediate data and formal publication. And usually they don't go beyond their specific narrow field, their specialty. And this has been a problem. But now more climate scientists that are working in some field of climate change are actually going beyond their immediate um, area, narrow focused area, their silo, and they're saying things, you know, um, in all different, um, to all different levels, right? So these guys up above that they quoted are, are poo pooing anything else. But they, that's not their area of expertise. They're a special, they're a specialist in one specific area. The UN, of course, running the conference, the United Nations Framework uh, on Climate Change. Framework Center on Climate Change includes even its intergovernmental panel on climate change, the IPCC, that does the reports. These are so dominated by economist concerns, they're so bent by political considerations that extraneous noise obscures the scientific signal. Okay, they're they're supposed to they're they're a consensus effort. Okay, so what is uh, Hans Jo Jochim? Sheldon Huber Du, Director Emeritus of Germany's Potsdam Institute. Um, what does he argue? And I think uh, Stefan um, uh, Ramsdorf is, is, is now the direct, is the Emeritus now, but he's still connected. I think maybe he's retired or he's still very active, but I don't think he's a director anymore four years later. He, he argues that a trend towards erring on the side of least drama has emerged, and the issue is the survival of civilization is at stake. Conventional means of analysis may become useless. Okay, so you can't discount um, these ideas just because a couple prominent scientists say that they're not going to happen. I mean, that, that's absurd. Exploring this argument, policy analyst David Spratt and Ian Dunlop conclude, climate policy making for years has been cognitively dissonant, a flagrant violation of reality. So it's unsurprising that there is a lack of understanding amongst the public and elites of the full measure of the climate challenge. People just don't really get how bad climate change is, even though we try to tell them in mainstream scientific publications and official reports, the truth about climate change and the fate of civilization vary very deeply between the lines. But there's other contexts in which experts are not quite so reticent and whose assertions echo Roger Hallett's. As much as a decade ago, so this would have been in the late... Uh, um, this would have been in, in uh, around 2010 or so. It was a climate symposium organized to discuss the implications of a four degrees Celsius warmer world. And we're pushing against two right now. The average for this year is, is, is going to be about 1.5 or slightly above. Okay. At the climate symposium, they agreed that less than a billion people will survive a 40 degree C world. Shallon Huber said, at 4 degrees Celsius, Earth's carrying capacity estimates are below 1 billion people. 
So that would be seven billion. There's eight billion of us now, so that would be seven billion cats plus all of the, you know, plus the, you know, the, the extra people from the growth. You know, where where are we going to peak? We could have a lottery on where pop Earth population will peak. That'd be an, a fun thing to do. Kevin Anderson, a great guy at the UK Tyndall Center, said only about 10% of the planet's population would survive at 4C. I mean, that's a good estimate, I think. Johan Rockstrom, current director of the Potsdam Institute, he said that in a 4C warmer world, it's difficult to see how we could accommodate a billion people or even half a billion people. Okay, so maybe it's 5% people would survive for the sea. There will be a rich minority of people who survive with modern lifestyles, no doubt. There will be a turbulent, conflict-ridden world. Meanwhile, greenhouse gases are still increasing. But not just increasing, they're increasing at accelerating rates. Also, a global average temperature of increase of 4 degrees, it means the Arctic would likely increase about 16 degrees losing all of the snow and ice there. Antarctic would increase much more. Land temperatures would increase at double this. Ocean temperatures at, at about half this. Um, and at high altitudes, it will increase, you know, uh, double, double the average at high altitudes. Okay, so land temperatures would be 5.5 to 6, warmer away from the coast. I'd say this is an underestimate, probably more like 8 Much of the tropics would be too hot for humans to survive. Many densely populated parts of the temperate zone would be desertified. Okay, so places in the Middle East would become, a lot of them would become uninhabitable. You know, maybe that's not such a bad thing given what we're seeing going on there right now. Before Celsius warmer world map suggests that as much as half the planet would become uninhabitable. Before Celsius world assumes business as usual, there are no new climate policies in coming decades. Known and unknown feedback mechanism could make 4C possible, even with new politically acceptable possibility policy. Okay, so we might, we're heading there anyway, perhaps, if we, if, if we breach all these feedbacks. David Spratt asks and answers, so did Roger Allen go far? too far? Not at all. There's serious research and eminent voices in support of the statement. The gross error in all of this are those who cannot countenance this conversation. So so they can't even fathom this conversa conversation many people, many mainstream scientists. They just poo-poo it out. It's ridiculous. They, they, it's too painful for them to even, even uh, address Okay, uh, and that goes with many politicians, government leaders, they just, you know, most of the world cannot countenance this conversation. That's why it's very important to have it and to uh, talk about it. You know, it's not going to go away. Um, it's going to be there and we're accelerating towards it. So this uh, begs the question of whether all those would countenance any uncomfortable conversation. Like population, for example, has long been a forbidden topic, despite being uh, one of the root causes of the ecological crisis. Right? It's been the elephant in the room in climate talks for many, many years. Where might a discussion of population ecology lead? Would its conclusion be any more politically acceptable? Okay, so here, let's talk about some of the key factors um, which support the idea that, you know, the vast majority of the human population won't be around by 2100 or sooner. Okay, we can begin by gaining some insight into the startling implications of exponential growth. Okay, humans just do not understand exponential growth. When something's growing exponentially, it has a constant doubling time. Like a population growing at 2% a year, it'll double every 35 years. 
the increase that occurs during any doubling period would be greater than the sum of the increases experienced in all previous doublings, right? It's just it's some type of growth, and we just can't fathom it. We we're linear thinkers. So here's the here's the figure of world population, right? It's all happening in the last little bit here. It took 200,000 years to reach its first billion in the 1800s. In other words, population growth was negligible for 99.95% of human history. But when sustained exponential growth kicked in, it took just 200 years, one one thousandth of the time in human history for the population to top 7.5 billion early in this century. So, you know, it's just uh, it's, it's just this type of growth that people can't get their heads around. It's a classic hockey stick curve, if you like. At most, just 10 of 10,000 generations of modern humans have experienced this unprecedented human explosion. Just a, right? You're, you're very privileged. You're alive. You're watching this video on technology like your smartphone or your computer. And you're only 10 of 10,000 generations of modern humans that have seen this type of growth in human population. So this population, this is a key factor. This population explosion of humanity could not have occurred without abundant cheap energy, particularly fossil fuels. Okay, without fossil fuels, there is no way we could have undergone this population growth, this exponential growth. There's other factors involved, but energy is essential for humans to produce the food and acquire all the other resources needed to grow both populations and the economy. While human numbers were increasing by a factor of seven, energy consumption grew by a factor of 25, the gross world product, uh, real gross world product, ballooned a hundredfold, okay, all exponential. Because of sometimes super exponential growth, grows even faster than exponential growth, and when you reach tipping points, that's just like a, like a, a state change, right? It's way, way faster than exponential growth, a tipping point, a state change, an abrupt change, abrupt climate change, right? You hear me talk Brought all the time for many, many years. Because of sometimes super exponential growth, half of all the fossil energy and many other essential resources ever used have been consumed in just the past 30 to 35 years. Go look at the Paul Club of Rome study about the resources. Look no further to explain why human induced climate change has suddenly become so urgent. Right? The pace of change is unprecedented. The recent spur of population, economic, and consumption growth that we today consider to be the norm actually represent the single most anomalous period in human history. There's nothing close to the norm is what you can see in your lifetime. Meanwhile, of course, Earth hasn't grown at all. On the contrary, natural life support has arguably contracted, right? We're losing habitable parts of the earth, right? We, we fished out 90% of the large fish in the ocean, right? We've been to every part of the earth and the certification is making regions near, near in the tropics less and less uh, conducive to supporting any life whatsoever. So global eco ecological deterioration indicates that the human enterprise has overshot our long-term carrying capacity. We're currently growing the human population and economy by liquidating once abundant stocks of so-called natural capital and over by overfilling natural waste sinks. So we're literally converting the ecosphere, the environment around us, into human bodies. Prodigious quantities of cultural artifacts and vastly larger volumes of entropic waste. That's what tropical deforestation, fisheries collapses, plummeting biodiversity, ocean pollution, climate change. That's what they're all about. So they're basically, the earth is losing its ability, its capacity to support human life. Corollaries, we will not be able to maintain the present population 
addition that curbed average material standards. And population growth toward 10 billion will accelerate the depletion of essential bioresources, the destruction of life support functions upon which civilization for everybody depends. Right? This, the recent boom, the recent history of human population dynamic, it resembles a boom bust cycle of any other species. This is nothing new. Any other species introduced to a new habitat with abundant resources and no predators, there's very little negative feedback. Um, the population expands rapidly, exponentially. It depletes the essential resources. It pollutes its habitat. We, we basically have overshoot. And we have negative feedbacks, overcrowding, disease, starvation, resource scarcity, competition, conflict that reasserts itself and the population crashes to a level at or below theoretical carrying capacity and they go locally extinct in some places. So we get this boom bust. It's a way it's a way of the world. The boom bust, you know, nutrients are depleted and then you get the bust cycle. You know, go and look at the limits to growth. Uh, part of the video I just did and you can see this exact thing for Okay. The world community can still choose to influence the speed and depth of the coming bus phase. And we're basically running out of time for that. Some species habitats or populations in simple habitats, they cycle repeatedly through the boom and bus phases. Right? And the, the height of the boom is called the plague phase. The hypothesis is that we're Homo sapiens are currently approaching the peak of the plague phase of a one of global population cycle and because of depleted resources, habitat deterioration, and psychosocial feedback, including possible war over remaining assets sometime in this century. But wait, I hear you protest. Humans are not just any other species. There's something special about us. We're smarter. We can plan ahead. We just won't let this happen. Perhaps, but what is the evidence so far that our leaders even recognize the problem? Now, this was written four years ago. What is the evidence even since this was written? It's all to worsen the problem. The evidence is that, you know, we'll hold another call, we promise this and that. Greenhouse gases still rise at an accelerating rate. Temperature rise is accelerating. Look how much it's gone up in the last four years. We're heading into global boiling, basically. So there's no evidence that our leaders will do anything. The crash may be triggered or exacerbated by the depletion or abandonment of economic stocks of fossil fuels. Right? Modern civilization is a product of and dependent on accessible, abundant energy. There's no viable alternatives to fossil fuels at the moment, not on the scale that we need. Sure, renewables are increasing. Yeah, they're talking about increasing nuclear power, you know, doing all of these different things, but part is just not in it. People just don't give a, give a crap. And, uh, you know, we're, we're going to go into very, very harsh times and a much lower population in, in the coming years. Even if we do develop equivalent substitutes for fossil fuel, they will at best merely delay the crash. And we talk about, look at Tim Gehrer and, and uh, entropy and, and enthalpy of the earth, you know, those sort of things. The long-term human carrying capacity of earth after ecosystems have recovered from the current plague is probably one to three billion people depending on technology and material standards of living. Estimates vary from fewer than a billion to a trillion people, right? Listen, don't listen to Musk. He wants you know, more and more and more people on the planet. He just doesn't get the, the, the severity of this problem. Getting there would mean five to nine billion fewer, fewer people on the planet. Right, to go to one to three billion, that's five to nine fewer billion people, especially if we get up to ten, right? This is where we end up after recovery following either controlled descent, 
wouldn't a controlled dissent make much more sense and give us much more chance and preserve many of the plants and animals on the earth? But, you know, it's not going to happen because there's no sign of us doing this. So it's going to be a chaotic crash. Making the looming disaster an election issue. Right? The first thing we take from this analysis is that we are once again playing in Roger Howland's death toll ballpark. But a more important point is that climate change is not the only existential threat confronting modern society. We could initiate any number of conversations that end with the self-induced implosion of civilization and the loss of 50 to 90 percent of humanity. And that places the global community in a particularly embarrassing predicament. Homo sapiens, that self-proclaimed most intelligent of species, is facing a genuine, unprecedented, hydro-like ecological crisis, yet its political leaders, economic elites, and sundry other messiahs of hope will not countenance a serious discussion conversation about any of the devilish heads of the hydra, right? The people don't want to go there, they don't want to talk about it. Climate change is perhaps the most aggressively visible head, yet despite decades of high-level talks, well, we're up to COP28, so it's 33 in all, and that was four years ago, several international agreements to turn things around, atmospheric CO2 and other greenhouse gases have more than doubled to over 37 gigatons and they're still rising at record rates and four years later they were accelerating at even greater record rates and the earth is starting to produce fossil fuels coming out of the marshland the wetlands etc these things are going to dwarf human emissions soon okay so the only certainty is the longer we deny reality and delay concerted action, the steeper and deeper the crash is likely to be. Where does that leave us? Okay, so Jonathan Franzen, and I'll, 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 in the other article, which I'm going to show you um, quickly, he says you can keep hoping that catastrophe is preventable, or you can accept that disaster is coming and begin to rethink what it means to have hope. Certainly hope is sterile and unaccompanied by vigorous action that reflects looming reality. Okay, so it talks about the Canadian election uh, back in 2019-2020. Sitting MPs, huh? just how much time have they spent contemplating these issues or debating them in caucus? Zero. What is their party's plan for the coming great unraveling? Zero. Okay. <laughs> okay, anyway, it's a great article. Have, have a look at it. Um, and, if, and follow me on Twitter, and you can just find it. I just posted it uh, earlier, earlier today. Um, enervating, if you didn't know what that word is, it causes one to feel drained of energy or vitality. So having hope without any action is enervating. And another word was countenance. Um, it's, uh, it, it, he was reluctant to countenance the use of force, to even consider, to consider it a possibility. So, so, so many, many people are policymakers, government leaders. They, they don't want to even countenance the idea that climate can make humans extinct or kill six billion people, etc., etc. Okay, um, so cultural comment, what if we stop pretending? The climate apocalypse, the apocalypse is coming. To prepare for it, we need to admit that we can't prevent it. Okay, there, there's, so Kafka, I love some quotes in here, right? Kafka says, there is infinite hope, only not for us. <laughs> so this is a fittingly mystical epigram from a writer whose character strives for ostensibly reachable goals and tragically or amusingly never managed to get any closer to them. Sounds like us. In our rapidly darkening world, the converse of Kafka's quip is 
perfectly true. There is no hope except for us. I'm talking about climate change. The struggle to rein in global carbon emission to keep the planet from melting down has a feel of tough constriction. The goal's been clear for 30 years, despite we're at COP28, 28th COP. Despite earnest efforts, we've made essentially no progress towards reaching our goals. The scientific evidence is verges on irrefutable. If you're younger than 60, you have a good chance of witnessing the radical destabilization of life on Earth. Massive crop failures, apocalyptic fires, imploding economies, epic flooding, hundreds of millions of refugees fleeing regions made uninhabitable by extreme heat or permanent drought or bombs, you know, if you're in, the, in, in Gaza. If you're under 30, you're all but guaranteed to witness it. If you care about the planet and about the people and animals who live on it, there are two ways to think about this. You can keep on hoping that catastrophe is preventable and feel ever more frustrated or enraged by the world's inaction, by COP28 being run by an oil company executive, or you can expect that disaster is coming and begin to rethink what it means to have hope. So, you know, expect that Trump will be elected in the U.S. and that the U.S. will get out of all climate agreements and policies because that's what the odds are that that's what will happen. Just look at the Vegas odds. Early at this late date, expressions of unrealistic hope continue to abound. Hardly a day seems to pass without my reading that it's time to roll up our sleeves and save the planet. The problem of climate change can be solved if we summon the collective will. This message may have been true in 1988, when the science became fully clear. We've emitted as much atmospheric carbon in the past 30 years as we did in the previous two centuries of industrialization. Okay, the facts have changed, but somehow the message stays the same. Psychologically, this denial makes sense. Despite the outrageous fact that I'll soon be dead forever, I live in the present, the present, not the future. Given a choice between an alarming abstraction, death, and the reassuring evidence of my senses, breakfast, coffee, my mind prefers to focus on the latter. The planet, too, is still marvelous, marvelously intact, still basically normal. So, you know, 100,000 people could fly to Dubai to the climate conference and have expensive dinners and eat and be in expensive hotels and rah, rah, cheer, cheer, we got to save the planet. You know, another election year coming, new comedies on Netflix. The impending collapse is even harder to wrap my mind around than death. It's easy to imagine uh, our own death rather than the death of, what's, of the planet, of, of billions of people, which seem to be, you know, where, where we're headed. Other kinds of apocalypse, whether religious, or thermonuclear, or asteroidal, they at least have the binary neatness of dying. One moment the world is there, the next moment it's gone forever. You know, we can fathom that. Climate apocalypse is messy. It will take the form of increasingly severe crises, compounding chaotically until civilization begins to fray. Things will get very bad, but maybe not too soon, and maybe not for everybody. Maybe not for me. Some of the denial, however, is more wealthy. Right? The evil of the Republican Party's position on climate science is well known. This was four years ago, remember. But denial is entrenched in progressive politics, too. The Green New Deal is the blueprint supposed to be the last chance to avert catastrophe and save the planet the way of gargantuan renewable energy projects. Right? Many of the groups that support these proposals, uh, and those on the right and Democrats, left and on Democrats, they deploy the language of stopping climate change. There's still time to prevent it, right? The left prides itself on listening to climate scientists who do indeed allow that catastrophe is theoretically avertable. 
But not everyone seems to be listening carefully. The stress falls on the word theoretically. Our atmosphere and oceans can absorb only so much heat before climate change, intensified by various feedback loops, spins completely out of control. Some scientists and policymakers fear that we're in danger of passing this point of no return. If global mean temperature rises by more than two degrees Celsius, maybe more, but also maybe less, and we're basically hitting days of two degrees Celsius. The IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, tells us that to limit the rise to less than two, we not only have need to reverse the trend of the past three decades, we need to approach net zero emissions in the next three decades, right? This is to say the least a tall order. It also assumes that you trust your calculation. New research demonstrates that climate scientists, far from exaggerating the threat of climate change, have underestimated its pace and severity. You must follow James Hansen and his work if you want to know what's really going on. To project the rise in the global mean temperature, scientists rely on complicated atmospheric modeling. They take a host of variables and run them through supercomputers to generate, say, 10,000 different simulations in the coming century to make the best prediction. When a scientist predicts a rise of 2 Celsius, she's merely, or he's merely naming a number by which she's very confident the rise will be at least 2 degrees. In fact, it could be much, much higher. Okay. Uh, as a non-scientist, the, art, the, art, the article author said, I do my own kind of modeling as a non-scientist. I run future scenarios through my brain, apply the constraints of human psychology and political reality, take note of the relentless rise in global energy consumption, count the scenarios in which collective action of emerge catastrophe, the scenario certain necessary conditions. The first condition is that every one of the world's major polluting countries institute draconian conservation measures, shut down much of its energy and transportation infrastructure, and completely rebuild its economy. The carbon emissions from existing global infrastructure, if operating for its normal lifetime, will exceed our entire emissions allowance. Further gigatons of carbon that can be released without crossing the threshold of catastrophe. This does not include thousands of new energy and transportation projects already planned or under construction. To stay within that allowance of top down intervention needs to happen not only in every country but throughout every country. Making New York City a green utopia will not avail in technically pumping oil and driving pickup trucks. Okay, the actions taken by a country must be the right one. Vast sums of government money must be spent without wasting it, without finding the wrong pockets. It's useful to recall the cap test joke of the European Union biofuel mandate. They accelerated deforestation of Indonesia for palm oil plantation. The American subsidy of ethanol fuel turned out to benefit no one but corn farmers. What about the idea of methane in the bridge fuel? What about the idea of uh, the hydrogen economy that's now being put, pushed by the fossil fuel company? Right? It's all, it's all just a, a, a complete ruling of government in the American Accept the reality of climate change and have faith in the extreme measures taken to combat it. They can't dismiss news they dislike as fake. They have to set aside nationalism and class and racial resentment, make sacrifices for distant threatened nations and distant future generations. They have to be permanently terrified by hotter summers and more frequent natural disasters rather than just getting used to them. Every day, instead of thinking about breakfast, they have to think about death. Call me a pessimist or call me a humanist, but I don't see human nature fundamentally changing anytime soon. I can run 10,000 scenarios through my model, 
through my mind, and in not one of them do I see the two degree target being met. Right? To judge from recent opinion polls, and again, this was four years ago, which show a majority of Americans are pessimistic about the planet's future. Um, of course, they talk about David Wallace Wells' great book, The Uninhabitable Earth. Right? There's many people that are starting to reach this conclusion, but there's a reluctance to broadcast it. Some climate activists argue that if we publicly admit that the problem can't be solved, it will discourage people from taking any action at all. Well, have they taken any action at all? <laughs> this is like a patronizing calculation. It's also an ineffectual one, given how little progress we have to show for it to date. The activists who remind, make it remind me of the religious leaders who fear that without the promise of eternal salvation, people won't bother to behave well. Non-believers are no less, less, less loving of their neighbors and believers. And so I wonder what might happen if instead of denying reality, we told ourselves the truth. First of all, even if we can no longer hope to be saved by two degrees of warming, there's still practical and ethical case for reducing carbon emissions. In the long run, it probably makes no difference how badly we overshoot shoot two degrees. Once the point of no return is passed, the world will become self-transforming, right? All these feedbacks kick in. Halfway cutting our emissions would make the immediate effects of warming seem less severe, but it would somehow only postpone the point of no return. Right? The most terrifying thing about climate change is the speed at which it's advancing or accelerating. The monthly shattering of temperature records um, and so on. Okay, so, you know, and the article continues to go on and it gives some good examples. Uh, although the actions of one individual have zero effect on the climate, this doesn't mean that they're meaningless. Each of us has an ethical choice to make. During the Protestant Reformation, when end times is merely an idea, not the horribly concrete thing it is today, a key doctrinal question was whether you should perform, perform good works because it will get you into heaven, or whether you should perform them simply because they're good. Because while heaven is a question mark, you know that this world would be better if everybody performed good, thing, good things. I can respect the planet and care about the people with whom I share it without believing that what I do will save me or save the planet. More than that, a false hope of salvation can be actively harmful. If you persist in believing that catastrophe can be averted, you commit yourself to tackling a problem so immense that it needs to be everybody's overriding priority forever. One result, weirdly, is a kind of complacency. By voting for green candidates, riding a bike to work, avoiding air travel, you might feel that you've done everything you can for the only thing worth doing. Whereas if you accept the reality that the planet will soon overheat to the point of threatening civilization, there's a whole lot more you should be doing. Right? Our resources aren't infinite. If we invest much of them in the longest shot gamble, reducing carbon emissions in the hope that it will save us, it's unwise to invest all of them. Every billion dollars spent on high-speed trains, which may or may not be suitable for North America, is a billion not banked for disaster preparedness, reparations to inundated countries, or future humanitarian relief. Okay, so, you know, when it talks about all out war on climate change made sense only as long as it was winnable. Don't you accept that lost it, other kinds of action take on greater meaning. Okay, and uh, you know, he talks about, uh, you know, and he also talks about hope and more hope and, uh, you know, some local things that were going on, um, like the homeless garden, where, 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 where the author is, um, and projects. So, so keep doing the right thing for the planet, yes, but also keep trying to save what you love specifically. A community, an institution, a wild place, a species that's in trouble. Take heart in your small successes. 
And any good thing you do now is arguably a hedge against the hotter future. But the really meaningful thing is that it's good today. As long as you have something to love, you have something to hope for. But, uh, you know, hope, hoping that the planet is going to survive or civilization is, is, is uh, you know, it's, it's pretty, it's getting pretty pointless, I think. Anyway, it's a great uh, paper, great two articles, and uh, this will have to be my title, the uh, Abandon Hope All Ye Who Enter Here. Very, very famous uh, phrase. Anyway, thank you for listening, and uh, you know, if you're at COP, uh, enjoy, your, uh, enjoy the warm weather in the desert, and uh, you know, to uh, make a difference.